the root of all problems and solutions, creating an AI workforce. Moderated by Minyan Clyburn. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So as we um, uh, settle in, I often uh, pick a word for the day. It kind of governs uh, how I conduct myself oftentimes and just my frame of mind. But today, I'm going to pick an image of the day. And if you look at uh, your screen, one of our commissioners uh, shared uh, with me, Commissioner Louie, shared with me this image. And I think it really sets the tone and the stage and underscores the importance of why we're here and, of course, the significance of this panel. Now, this is a Chinese book for kindergartners. And circle, even if you don't speak Chinese, circled are two letters, AI. Kindergarten. Textbook, AI. Now, the senator talked about us tooling ourselves and, 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 and getting ready from grade school to grad school. Now we're talking about kindergarten or even pre-K if we're going to uh, be, uh, keep ahead and, and, and really stay number one uh, when it comes to AI. So I just wanted to start with this image because, again, it, it really, for me, underscores the urgency of why this commission was formed and why you think it's and know it's so important uh, uh, that we are here today. So SCAI has a broad mandate. And Working Group 3 is charged with recommending concrete steps that the government should take to build and maintain an AI machine learning workforce that can address the national security and defense needs of the United States. Over the last eight months, this working group has assessed the current state of the national security enterprises AI workforce, explored the roles of an AI workforce, um, ex explored the, the, uh, the roles of an AI, uh, how the AI workforce might and should play, and examine how the government might recruit, train, educate, manage, and to the extent that is necessary, retrain an AI workforce. Now, here are our judgments thus far. And you will affirm this if you read uh, the report. National security, security agencies need a holistic workforce renovation for the AI era. That includes extending AI familiarity throughout organizations, infusing ethical training at every level, and spreading the use of modern software tools. Developing AI-ready leaders is especially critical because without more well-informed leaders who can go beyond talking points and reshape their organizations, the defense and intelligence communities will fail to compete in the AI era. Now I am a little hesitant because of all of uh, uh, the military presence here today, but I am going to make this uh, next uh, point. The Department of Defense and the intelligence community do not have effective ways to identify AI-relevant skills that, are, that already exist in their workforce. So I will make it out alive. Thank you very much. <laughs> They often fail to capitalize on their technical talent. Existing hiring authorities are adequate or close to adequate, more to the point. Government agencies and departments are not fully utilizing civilian hiring authorities to recruit AI talent, often due to risk-averse human resource teams and commanders or civilian leaders that do not hold them sufficiently accountable. Am I gonna walk out still? It is less clear if the same hold is, is holding true when it comes to pay scales. Fourth, expanding AI-focused fellowship and exchange opportunities can give officials and service members access to cutting-edge technology and bring talent from our top AI companies into federal service. These programs already exist, and we've been talking about uh, this today, but they need to expand 
Government employees who gain valuable skills from the private sector should have an opportunity to use them when they return to government service. And my complimentary fifth point is the military and national security agencies struggle to compete for top AI talent. The government needs to spend more effort showing that service is an opportunity to solve unique, exciting problems and have a pos positive impact. It should try to reduce, if it exists, any disparagement of its workforce and better use pathways for recent graduates. Now, there are two additional hard questions that we will explore with our panelists today. Since the American AI talent pool, as you know, depends heavily on international students and workers. Our global competitiveness hinges on our ability to attract and retain top minds from around the world. If we fail to do so, it is unclear how we will continue to compete. And colleges and universities are under strain to keep pace with student interest in AI and computer science generally. The number of computer science majors is increasing at 10 times the rate of tenure track faculty. So to begin and to continue this discussion, we've asked Dr. James Manika, Chairman of the Director uh, with the Chairman and Director with the McKinsey Global Institute, and I take liberties with names, especially if it's, okay. uh, it allows me to, uh, you know, use some consonants that I don't usually use a lot. <laughs> the former Principal and Deputy Director of, the, of National Intelligence, Sue Gordon, and Gary Bowes, the Chair of the Future of Work for Singularity uh, University. They will provide uh, their perspectives on these two questions, primarily but not exclusively. How important is organizational structure for capitalizing on emerging technology talent? And how should the national security enterprise educate leaders and end users who do not participate in the development process to deploy, use, and resource AI ML solutions effectively and ethically? Ms. Gordon. Very and thoughtfully. <laughs> No, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so my very was organizational construct is very important. And the second is how you deal with your existing workforce. Uh, you have to do it thoughtfully. Um, but let me create a quick stack for you that I think begins both before that and extends after it. Um, I think of four things that we need to have in order to effectively integrate uh, these technologies into our workflow. So the first is you have to have imperative. Um, the organization has to believe it must. If the organization doesn't believe that it must, then it will be a technology or it will be left to the innovators and you will have change, but it will not be at scale and it will not be at speed. So for the intelligence community, you need to see the world as it is. You need to understand what your mission is it isn't about secrecy, it's about knowing a little bit more a little bit sooner. And if you look at this world with abundant data and ubiquitous technology, speed of decision making that you need, then if you're the intelligence community and you're a leader, then you must find a way to introduce the ability to handle data, like I say, from speed and from volume, but also to sense making differently and the technologies that are emergent are ones that you must have. So you have to have imperative and you have to have C-suite buy-in. Because if not, you'll fit it in to what's left over after you've done your real mission. And so that's number one. The second thing is you need infrastructure. And earlier panels talked about the information infrastructure to support it. Um, we all are in various stages of building that infrastructure. Even those of us who have built infrastructure built it for humans to use and now we're trying to figure out how Machines use that infrastructure because data uses it differently than people use it. Algorithms use it differently than they must. So there's that information infrastructure, but there's also the infrastructure that brings people into the mix. And the reason why you have to have that is so that people can play with the new capabilities. What's really important when you want to have data is you need to be able to integrate it with no cost. 
And if you don't have infrastructure that allows it, if you have barriers, you aren't going to be able to get that curiosity that's going to get the organization to figure out what it can do. And you won't get the mission pull to pair with the technology push. So you've got to have abundant infrastructure. Organization, you need two types of organization. You need an organization to support your technologists. We, I, would, I would opine that we can attract anybody. In the intelligence community, our mission is so exciting still, and such about possibility that people will come, but when they come in, they find that they aren't supported with the same sorts of things that they can find outside. And at the five to 10 year mark, they cannot stand not being able to pursue their craft, and so they go somewhere where they can. So you have to have a way to support them and technically and get them around people that you can. But the other thing is, you need to think about whether our organizational model needs to change because technology is so embedded in what we do that the serial process of the technologist sitting someplace else and pumping capability into a work unit is not necessarily the model we need. And so I think your organizational models change. So again, organizational construct for your technical humans and then new work units that allow the integration and the transfer ideas and at speed to happen. And the last one is you need process. Um, and you need process uh, revolution. Because even when a leader wants it, and you have the infrastructure supporting it, and you have the organizations that demand it, all of them come crashing into processes that were never de expected to be designed for this moment. And we dash people on the shoulders of despair because our contracting process or our information processes or the rules that do that. And so I think one of the things we need to do is think about who we're putting in charge of designing new processes because the people we have now don't. As far as how you deal with a mixed workforce, you need to provide the opportunity to, through those things I mentioned, for people who want to come to be able to come. And you have to recognize that some people aren't going to be able to come and you need to be able to treat them honorably and offer them other solutions. And we do have a demographic problem that we're going to have to address. The leadership, I think, is the most, the middle leadership is probably our most urgent need. Because if I have middle leadership that does not understand that this is fundamentally a technical world, they won't trust that the ideas coming up can actually affect the solution, and I'll end it there. Now, I appreciate that because it, it, it really underscores um, the culture, you know, right. what, what, what people find when they get there. Um, and, right. and, again, I appreciate those four, four points, uh, primarily, uh, four points, primarily everything that you said. I, I appreciate Good. it. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Menyika? Uh, well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for, for having me. And uh, I'd like to applaud the, the report that the commission's put out. I think it's very, very spot on. I know there's a lot more work still to come, but I really enjoyed seeing what was already in there. I also particularly like the fact that uh, it puts talent at the center and a talented workforce at the center of the AI composition. That's actually absolutely critical. And in particular, when you think about the, I think it was mentioned earlier in the discussions today, the triangle that is government, universities, and the private sector. That's a critical triangle when it comes to these issues of talent. Now, what is it about the AI talent specifically that we need to address and that we then need to see reflected in our organization? I would argue that there are basically uh, four or five specific things that are worth understanding with regards to the AI workforce talent question. Uh, and I'll frame these as problems. Uh, the first problem we have is what I'll call the too few problem which is we just don't have enough people with distinctive AI capabilities in the government, and you could even argue broadly in the economy. So we have a too few problem that we need to solve for somehow. Now, this is coupled with the second problem, which is a, what I'll call the pipeline problem. If you look at the pipeline that's supposed to feed the talent needs we're going to need in AI, it's woefully weak, whether we look at K through 12, whether we look at universities, and whether we look at the places we've historically relied on 
for talent, which has been a good domestic pipeline, but also uh, international students coming to the United States and other places. Uh, so the pipeline issues are actually enormous. I was quite struck by the fact that if you look at some of the data the personal management office in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the agent, federal agencies have put out that suggests that, for example, only something like, I think, less than 3% of IT, or of all IT professionals are actually under the age of 30. I think that's problematic if we think about these pipeline questions. So the pipeline challenge is, is absolutely important. The third challenge I'd actually put out on the talented workforce is what I'll call the, you know, we have a many, many types needed problem. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I think often when we have this conversation about a talented workforce for AI, uh, we need many different types. We're not just talking about the deep experts. We need those. We need many of those. We don't have enough of those. We probably need to have you know, PhDs or postdocs, whatever they've had. But we also need people who are developers, who are going to not be doing the fundamental research, but doing the development work to build applications. We're also going to need users who understand enough to be able to know how this fits into workflows and how they actually use these technologies. We're going to need leaders. You know, you can go on. In fact, the report, I think, actually does some work trying to categorize the different types that are needed. But I think it's important to recognize there's a whole talent ecosystem here and value chain that has different kinds of capabilities and different kinds of roles. Some of those are easier to train and transition people to. Some of them are harder. But it's not a monolithic problem when it comes to the AI workforce. Problem number four is what I might call the flow problem. And the flow problem is, the, is, a, is a challenge that between the elements of the triangle, the flows aren't, don't work very well. And in fact, you could argue of the three legs of that triangle, government, universities, and, and private sector, right now, most of the flow is to the private sector, mm -hmm. almost entirely. And the government is, getting, is, the, is the, getting the short end of that stick. So how do we unstick and solve the flow problem? is actually problematic. And by the way, this problem is also even real, even for universities. It, it used to be the case, so I did my PhD in AI and robotics about 23 years ago. It tells you how old I am. But at that time, if you're looking for the best cutting edge research in AI and robotics, you'd look at, the, at a handful of universities. That's where the best work is being done. That's not true anymore. Much of the most amazing, groundbreaking, fundamental research is actually in the private sector. So the, the flow problem here is, is a big challenge. Let me, let me highlight one other last one. And I think I know in some of the conversations this has come up. And I might characterize this provocatively as a bit of a mission problem. It's a mission problem in the following sense, which is I think it used to be the case that you could imagine uh, you know, technologists. Uh, and, and there was a time when people would imagine that if you wanted to do something good for the world, you'd go into public service. You go into the military. You do things that were good for society. I think in the realm of technology, technologists now have a few more choices. So look at the young graduates who now see the private sector as mm -hmm. one of the ways to change the world, technology for good. So I think the, arguably the monopoly that public service used to have as a mechanism for smart, talented people to go do amazing things in the world has now many more other competitors. So I think there's more work that I think our national security agencies, the government needs to do to do this. Now, how do I, what does this mean for organizations and the organizational structure, which is one of the questions uh, you asked? And I think here there's some useful lessons from the private sector. You know, I spend a fair amount of time in the private sector. One of the things you see nowadays is that there was a time when uh, companies had a hard time understanding that technology is now fundamental to what they do. I think now everybody's come to realize that, in fact, every company is actually a technology company. It isn't something that those people in the corner room there do, but it's actually fundamental to the whole enterprise. And I think that mindset needs to come to our federal agencies that, in fact, this isn't just something that a few people are going to do over there in the corner. It's got to be part of the part of the system. And this shows up in a few places. It should affect the processes, as you suggested, so I won't go into that. Uh, but we should also think about uh, infrastructure. But let me take a particular twist to the infrastructure question. One of the things specific to AI, if you talk to any AI people, they'll tell you that, yes, you need amazingly smart people and the algorithms, but you also need compute, you also need tools, and you also need data. Yep. If you look at what, what is one of the reasons people go to the private sector for AI is compute and data and tools. 
And so making sure that the organizations have the ability to have, give people access to the leading tools, the, you know, the, the amount of compute that they need, the infrastructure that they need to be able to even do the work in interesting ways is also another piece of the organizational change that's required. The other, the other thing has to do is just ways of working. And I think General Shanahan pointed to this, talked about this in the morning, which is there's just often a mismatch, whether it's in terms of agility and pace, that you know, I think our, our defense agencies have typically worked historically that doesn't quite match the pace and agility and ways of working uh, that these technologies actually now require, whether it's about the ability to iterate, the ability to uh, test things and, and so forth. And all organizations have to be comfortable doing that. Let me end on at least a couple of notes that relate to, 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 uh, to, to people. One of the things that at least we've learned with, uh, if, you, if you like, the investment of technology uh, in the private sector is that, in fact, there's a metric that often sometimes people use, which is, you know, for every dollar of investment in the technology you make, you need to invest another 20 in the change management. So it's not just about buying the technology. There's all the change that actually needs to happen in the organization before organizations can fully capitalize this. And I think this is maybe perhaps what you're alluding to about the actual change that has to happen in our agency's work. And I'll end on this note, at least for now, uh, we, something we haven't really talked about, which is career pathways. One of the things that actually helps a lot is when you actually have, you know, when you bring people into organizations and there's actually career pathways that where they can actually grow and succeed to the highest levels of those organizations on the basis of unique skills that they're building. Again, you see this in companies all the time. I think until we started to see chief information officers and chief technology officers sit at the C-suite table and be able to affect organizations and people could see the career pathways, uh, this was not taken seriously. It wasn't those kids in the basement doing technology stuff, but this was actually, people could actually see how they could progress in the organization. I think that's some of the fundamental thinking that's gonna be required, I think, in our defense and national security agencies, which sort of takes you all the way to the topic of leadership, which you've already spoken about. But those are at least some lessons learned from our experience. Thank you. Good. And to round things out. Wonderful. So, um, no, I, I want to just, uh, I would say second or even third, the, the thanks for inviting me and, and for the marvelous work that's been done on the report to date. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of the output. So, um, Singularity University is a think tank based in, in Silicon Valley. Um, it's, it's neither uh, about the singularity nor is it a university. So there's some identity <laughs> issues that we're working on. Um, it's, not a, it's not a university because in the United States to be accredited, you have to actually pour glue on your curriculum for two years. And we change our curriculum every two months. We have 300 uh, brainiacs from around the world. They're experts on everything from artificial intelligence to next generation medicine. Um, and I get to, to pull from their brains a lot of the thoughts about the impact on, on uh, the future of work, future of the organization, and, um, and future of learning. And so I, if I sort of distill some of these things down into the way, so I sort of read some of the questions that we were asked. That they, that what, what, what I typically, the framing that I often get is, uh, so, so wait a minute, let me understand this. Are we trying to mostly put our efforts on upgrading humans, or are we trying to change the systems, including our organizations? And my answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to do both, you know, because the, the systems um, uh, out, in an outsized manner disadvantage the opportunities to be able to help the right kind of skills and capabilities to flow to solve the right kind of problems. And if you don't help people to continually have the tools and learning that they need, then you're gonna have this continual mismatch. So um, I'll focus first on the humans. Um, what what uh, I talk a lot about is that, um, sort of the framing that I see is that we're, we're going through as big a shift uh, as we did uh, going from agricultural to industrial economies. And we're shifting to what I call a digital work economy. And we're doing it in a, in a blindingly short period of time. And so what that means for humans is that there's a whole bunch of ways that we're reacting to that. And, um, and technology is, you know, is potentially a great enabler, but it's also increasing that pace. And so we're shifting to what I call a portfolio of work, which is rather than one person, one job, we're having this much more ambiguous set of, of different uh, constructs, with different uh, activities that people do. Uh, parents ask me all the time, why won't my kid get a real job? <laughs> uh, and the answer is uh, that uh, working at a day job, driving for Uber at night, working on a startup with your friends all simultaneously is a rational response to an exponentially changing world, right? And so it's a hedge strategy. 
And so how do you think about how you then leverage that kind of unbundling of work and being able to channel human energies to be able to solve the problems that you want? So, so that's the first opportunity, I think, is to think in terms of as we're trying to help humans to be able to upgrade themselves, there are macro issues going on with the workforce that we can actually leverage, we can actually take advantage of because it creates opportunity if we, if we uh, change our organizations in the right way. And it's one of those rare situations where the technology can actually be helpful if we, if we uh, use it correctly. Um, uh, I talk about the, the half a dozen AI superpowers, not, not that, uh, not it's, as uh, Kai-Fu Lu talks about, uh, China and, and Russia and others, but more what are the superpowers that actually the technology can help us to have so that we can be uh, supported in solving the problems of tomorrow. Um, and then uh, to the organization issues. So uh, in the same way that we're seeing so many of the constructs around the way that humans work changing, uh, the organization itself is a construct that's left over. I mean, li literally the whole idea of a corporate hierarchy and that sort of thing, you know, we, we trace back all the way to Alexander the Great. And in that shift from an agricultural to industrial model, we created this thing called the organization. And I, I use the analogy of a box. There's, there's abundance outside the box and there's scarcity inside the box. There's a corporate hierarchy, there's, there's slots, we want to stick people in the slots. And we did that as a sort of rational response to needing to be able to build factories and to be able to channel the energies, energies of humans when the, the best communications technology was a carrier pigeon. Well, now when we've got these, all these digital distraction devices that we all carry around and we can communicate instantaneously with half the people in the world, the organization has to change. And so I've written a lot on what we call unbundling the organization from my, my friend John Hagel, who's ex McKinsey. Um, and, uh, but basically the idea is to shift to the, if you want a picture of it, to shift to a model of a network. Uh, the more that you unbundle the organization, soften the walls of the organization, and this is especially germane to agencies, uh, apprenticeships, mentorships, uh, leveraging crowdsourcing platforms, uh, having people come through for tours of duty, anything that allows you to be able to take advantage of the uh, resources of the skill sets of people uh, that can actually help to solve these problems. You can open up that box uh, and turn it into a network, the better advantage you have. But the mentality that I, that I push for, um, I've, got, I've got nine courses on LinkedIn Learning where I talk a lot about these issues. One of, the, one of them, I, I, what I say is, it isn't any more about change management. It's about managing change. Change management was this mentality that there's a current state and a future state, and you can do the delta between them and then you're done. Uh, yeah, what's, what's, what's the difference between them? Okay, yeah, we've got our plan. Uh, it's only managing change. We can't see any point at which exponential change is going to slow down. As a matter of fact, one of our favorite phrases at Singularity University is, today is probably the slowest day of the rest of your life. You're going to look back in 10 years and say, you know, I remember when you kids didn't embed chips in your head and you weren't printing your clothes in your closets and that sort of thing. We can only see that it's going to increase. And so the idea that an organization actually has some future static state, we don't see that. And so the processes that you need to be able to help people to continually adapt, and especially as we think of it with the lens of AI and the technologies themselves that are not going to slow down, they're only going to increase, um, then we, we just need a bigger boat. We need a new way of thinking about solving these problems. So now that my head hurts, because, um, you know, because I, I'm listening to the three of you, and if there is a very simple refrain that I could put forth, is that you are demanding from us or asking us or you know, asking these organizations, government, you know, academia and the like, to do some things in ways that we're not organically um, you know, poised um, or, or to do. Because again, you're, you're throwing out the entire model which has built this very framework and you're saying going forward um, there, there might be, if, if you're not saying that, please counter um, uh, that um, the model going forward that will enable uh, all of uh, the things that, uh, you know, uh, that we speak of and the things that are necessary for national security, uh, that the way we went about it up until now is not the way that's going to get that, us to nirvana. So I think that's, I think that's right and not scary. Okay. Um, because I'm scared. <laughs> no, no, no. So I would be scared if I thought the future world was for the technology and the humans to self-organize. 
I, I, think, I think one of the difficulties of the last 20 years when the communications, instead of being Pony Express days when there was a lot of expense and so you knew the information you received had value, now it is infinitely available and yet humans are still trying to process it though it means something and we're trying to let even our, our private sector try and figure out where we ought to go or which technology. So here's what I think. You need government, I, but government can't act in this world to provide the functions that government does in the same way it did. I love your quotation on change. I have a different one, and that is I hate change, but I love relevance more. Okay. Right, so, so to me, what's the function of government? What's the function of national security? You must affect it, but you cannot affect it the way that we have. It, ju it just isn't working. It's, it's ripping at the seams. It's, it's too slow. But again, it's not you still expansive. Have the people, right. Um, and, uh, it, and I know you're getting right. there. No, but I, uh, you do still have the people. Right. But people without imperative are going to have a hard time delivering the outcome that we need. An imperative just to prosecute a technology or to take it as far as it would go has had the limitations to it. Look at Mark Zuckerberg sitting in front of Congress. Oh my God, I'm responsible. When he started, he didn't understand the responsibility of that volume and that technology has, and now he did it. So the reason why I'm not concerned is that if organizations understand what their purpose is, but let go of the modality and develop new craft, as you're articulating, I think we can get there. But if we either think it's willy-nilly or I've got to hold on to the ways that I've done it in the past, those two are antithetical to the kind of progress we need, which is why some people look at China and say, well, that's attractive. We ought to lock it down. That isn't America, right? That isn't going to yield it. It's some combination of those two things, but it's not either or. So how do you, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to get you. How do you, because you worked in government for uh, uh, more than a year or two. Since I was 20. Right. How in the world do we, do we get to your nirvana? No, I, I'm serious, but again, you've got sticky floors and very obvious ceilings that would, pre would p potentially prevent us from getting there. What are the, 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 the outlines? What are the one, two, and three things that will get us um, uh, you know, getting rid of that ceiling and, and unsticking us from that floor? I Be think leadership. I, you going you back cannot to convince me that leadership doesn't matter. It, it does. It sets the direction, the course, and the parameters and can make some of the rules. If from a government perspective, I think one of our responsibilities is to have a little bit longer horizon, horizon and deeper pocketbook. So I, I'm not going to endorse uh, Senator Schumer's proposal, but I like it because I think that's a very foundational thing that you need to do. You need more. And the other thing is we need to create a much more semi-permeable membrane between the public and the private sector for talent, for processes, for ideas, but it can't just be one way. The private sector's got to realize that their solutions have to work at scale. And so leadership, semi-permeable semi membrane, and reinvestment in the foundation that will allow us to have the basis for application going forward. Dr. Mayhew? Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm a little more optimistic than the question suggests for the following reasons. Um, so sorry, I'm from the South. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, well I, I'm optimistic for the following reasons, but there's still a call to action at the end of it. So the reasons for optimism, I see there's lots of instances of the kind of change and innovation we're talking about. Look at what the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Defense Department Innovation Board has recommended. Look at what's in this report. Look at what um, various leaders are doing. Look at the fellows programs that have started to emerge that you know, provide mechanisms to move back and forth between industry and the government. So you've got lots of these examples. So that's good. That's all, and look at some of the leaders who have emerged and stepped up, right? General Shanahan and others. I, I had the pleasure for the last year to work closely, and I was co-chairing with um, Admiral Bill McRaven, mm -hmm. uh, a task force on national security and innovation. So you, you've got these leaders who are emerging and these practices. I think the challenge is twofold. It's too small, mm -hmm. too incremental, 
and not moving quickly enough. And I think while in the past we might have been able to live with that uh, and you know, slowly adapt and change over time, this time is a little bit different. Yeah. Partly because, so you know, I love numbers. So if you think about it, take the investment question. We now have a competitor called China who's at scale. Just some fun numbers on this. If you had looked at the rate at which the US was investing in basic research, that feeds a lot of these innovation. The peak of that was in 1964, when we were spending 2% of GDP in basic science research. Now we sort of sustained that for a while, uh, and then it, it's dropped to date about 0.66% of GDP. Now look at the other side of the trajectory that China is on. At the rate at which they're investing, they're on path that in about a decade, if they keep up the rate of in investment spending, they'll be spending about 2.5% of their GDP at a time when, by all expectations, their economy will be about the size of our economy. So the, the scale and the pace we're talking about requires that we move much faster. So while I love all the fledglings and innovations and the calls to action and the, you know, the things that are in place, they just we just need to do them bigger and faster you know, that's, that's the challenge. And, yep. and you hinted to it because, again, you can't not, in terms of a particularly budgetary um, allocations to achieve this, you cannot ignore the political uh, dynamic. Well, and, but that's the reason why I think it's important that we, we, we find a way to bring the public along, okay. right? Because we have to get the support. I mean, we, you know, no one can just, it's a democracy. No one can just rewrite the budgets any way we want, right? That's the, that's the beauty of this country. But we have to, we have to bring the, 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 the public along to understand that this is actually quite important and quite foundational and quite fundamental to make these kinds of changes. Mr. Chairman? So, so, so a couple of things. So first off, um, I'm, not, I would, I'm the last person to suggest uh, complacency in terms of the nimbleness of government agencies. But, uh, but you have to know that out in industry, this is a work in progress. I mean, we've got all these poster children in Silicon Valley that talk about being very nimble companies. And I spend time with boards of directors <laughs> and CEOs who are asking exactly the same challenges. Yeah. I mean, they've got all the That's same true. problems. Yeah. It's typically the, you know, the, inno the innovator's dilemma or rather the incumbent's dilemma. And, uh, and so they're all trying to, to, to focus on the same issues. And they, but, but what you find is there's some consistency. So the first is courageous leaders so there have to be some people that are setting the North Star. Second is that they focus on the managers because that's the linchpin, and especially mid-management. They're the ones who are gonna decide whether or not your organization lives or dies. They're gonna manage all the information going up and all the, the power going down, and, uh, and they have to be trained in a new model. Um, and I know this sounds a little random, but uh, if you want a, a great book on the subject, read uh, Moonshots in Education yep. by our friend Esther Wojcicki. Oh, and what she yeah. says is in, in, in teaching, we're so, and I, don't get me started on education because I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go off on that one for a long time. But um, uh, although I have no moral standing because I never actually went to college. But um, uh, the, um, what she says is the old model is the sage on the stage and we need to move the guide to the guide on the side. And that's exactly the model for that adaptive manager, is how you help them to think of themselves not as the one that is controlling the work of, of their employees, it's the one that is actually enabling them to be able to dynamically bind around problems. And then the third place these organizations focus on often is alignment, is once you've got that path or the, the direction that you're going is what is the role of every individual in being able to enable that change and an ongoing process of change. So, so that's part of my answer is don't, you know, industry doesn't have this perfect, but they've got some processes that they're going through where they're trying to continually build adaptive organizations that, that can be learned from. Yeah, but, but, but Gary, industry can get this wrong. For these yeah. issues, for defense and national security, we can't get it wrong. So, right, in a risk management, yeah, <laughs> in, in, in an environment where the risks are higher, right. then the, yes, there's, so, so yes, there's a dynamic tension as to what, what kind of risk management processes you're gonna put in place. And, and it isn't just that you're, you're managing your citizens' money, it's that you're also managing their ability to have a secure, a secure uh, country. So there are no shrinking violets on this panel, so if you have any questions, 
Um, please raise your hands and we'll uh, get the, the mic to you. A lot of what we are speaking uh, in terms of uh, working group three, the questions, um, I, I was worried during the first part of the day, I'm like, I don't even know what we're gonna speak about now because a lot of the questions uh, were put forth. But if you want to uh, get more granular or re-ask the question uh, stated in a, a different way, now is your opportunity to do so. So if we, by show of hands, um, uh, uh, please help me because I don't know how many questions I have. So by show of hands, um, if you will uh, care to weigh into this conversation, uh, please do so at this time. We've got one taker. If you could uh, uh, briefly state uh, who you are, where you're from, and your question. Yes, uh, I'm Russell Schilling, uh, the American Psychological Association and a former DARPA PM and ONR. Um, one of the things uh, that I'm hearing you say uh, up here when we're discussing what the workforce needs to look like for innovation and AI, I still hear mostly um, computer scientists and technologists. Yeah. Right. Uh, and again, uh, what I, and I know my, my comrades in the DOD since I served there for 22 years. And so uh, I just wanted your, your, uh, to expand on that about the uh, diversity of talent you need on an AI, what an AI professional actually is uh, in your uh, worlds. Why don't, you, why don't you start? All right. So, so first off, we've been um, fighting about this. We, in the we have, room. yeah, <laughs> in a good-natured way. Um, so, first off, there is research going back to the 1950s when we shifted to from a war footing to a consumer economy. Um, that that was really good work on sort of understanding human skills. And it, and uh, I, I I like the framing. Sidney Finer is known as the, diction, the father of dictionary of occupational titles. He was sort of an honorary uncle of mine. He basically said there's these things that are called knowledges and these things that are called transferable skills. And so we've got this, and, and unfortunately today we call them hard skills and soft skills, but really it's, these are skills that are anchored or rooted in a particular arena, and these are skills that are usable in a range of different situations that are transferable. And what we've done is we get so over-indexed on the specific knowledges that we believe are needed at a particular period of time to be able to train people to be able to solve certain kinds of problems our education systems are geared towards that. The, the way that we're churning out people who have degrees is geared towards that. There's all these other skills that will allow people to be adaptive and collaborative and so on, and we're not training for those. The shelf life of information is decaying rapidly. And so instead, what, what I push people to think of is, well, what's the, rate, what's the portfolio of skills that we need? And the truth is, there's always going to be these you know, really deep knowledges that will continually change to be able to actually be uh, you know, the equivalent of, of the car mechanic. But the, a lot of people just need to know how to drive the car. And they've got to have a range of different perspectives to be able to solve problems with, with dynamic teams. I mean, that's just, it's, it's really clear. I mean, Google did this analysis and they found there's only two actual characteristics of high performance teams. Psychological safety, so you've got a bunch of people that all can, can brainstorm together, and psychological diversity. So it has to be a lot of the skills that we think of as being softer. It has to be you've got people trained in psychology and, and a range of different liberal arts backgrounds because that's the only way that you're going to solve the problem. But, but in Silicon Valley, we, we, we haven't gotten it right at all. We heavily over-index on the technical skills, and we have, are ignoring many of the others that are required to be able to solve problems dynamically. Doctor? Yeah, two, 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 two things to agree with that. One of the things that the report that, the, that uh, NASCAR just put out does, in fact, do a nice job of articulating the seven or eight different kinds of capabilities. And you look at that, the majority of them are not computer science. So that's one point. The other point, I think you're starting to see even the AI community recognizing this itself. Uh, so, for example, if you look at, I've been involved in setting up of what's now one of the largest academic institutions, the Stanford Human Centered AI Institute. And by design, that institute is a, is, is a multidisciplinary institute. If you look at it in terms of what's going on there, you, yes, you have computer scientists and roboticists, but you've also got people from the legal, from law, uh, people from the from philosophy. In fact, the the co-directors of the institute, one is a computer scientist, the other is a philosopher. So I think you're starting to see this recognition that this takes multiple skills and capabilities. So I think we need we do need to move away from this AI skills topic as being primarily about computer science. It isn't. Just to take a twist on that. Um, I think this is a technical world. I think everyone needs to be, I, I don't care your discipline, you need to be comfortable with technology. Yeah. 
you may not be the person who's developing, but if you are not a comfortable data swimmer or you're not comfortable with technology, you're going to have a hard time. Second is, as these technologies become more ubiquitous, the differentiator is going to be critical thinking. The way I characterize it, oh, you wanted to use it. <laughs> and so both the technologists have got to have in their head use, and the decision makers have to have that responsibility of use. So if you take Secretary Kissinger's comments, if you believe you have a responsibility for use, you will get to the issue of ethic. Because nothing changed about the responsibility of the organization or the human just because you introduced a technology. And I think he said application and interpretation. Right. Is that how right. So that I just think about you have to you have to understand the responsibility of use. And so to me that's the critical thinking piece. And so I actually think you're gonna see a resurgence of the liberal arts education as the technology permeates even more broadly than it has now, because that's gonna be what is gonna make the difference in terms of progress. I keep going back, and, and, and forgive me for being fixated, that's uh, it's a, kind of a sudden thing too, to be honest with you, um, is uh, again, you're speaking about um, you know, being disruptive within um, uh, both public and private sectors, uh, and affirming that the composition within those sectors will, uh, again, be more diverse in a number of ways, particularly when it relates to uh, uh, disciplines. But that, again, is not natural, it's not comfortable, um, and it's not easy to manage. Um, and uh, Especially in the government, where historically our promise is stability of employment. Right. Right? You said that out loud? <laughs> yeah, and, and that has given us some of the greatest accomplishments of free societies because of that. But it isn't necessarily the model that we need going forward. So I'm very proud to have served in the intelligence community for almost 40 years. When I talk to young people now, I say, it's the best first five to 10 years of your career. It, it, it is. Higher purpose, you'll understand the use case you will have more responsibility early. But at five to 10 years, I want you to move. I don't so think- So how do we make that sexy? No, okay, but I think so. we totally can. I think there are partnerships that we talked about in the field that you can imagine careers differently. I could imagine a company saying, we are going after the same talent, and I want that talent's first five years to be in the government. So, so you actually, and they're still my employee. You, you said, I think, the most key word. And so, so really, I think one of the greatest places you have to stand is, is purpose. Um, so um, uh, my, when I was a teenager, my father was a recovering minister. Um, uh, recovering minister. A recovering minister who had been laid off from his work, written out of the budget. And he went to go help other ministers who were being laid off. And he wrote a little pamphlet that turned into a book called What Color Is Your Parachute, which is the world's career manual. And the, one of the reasons I didn't go to college, I fell into the family business. So I was actually trained as a current counselor when I was 19. And he had a construct. He sort of broke down jobs and also the characteristics of us as humans into sort of seven different characteristics, including our skills and knowledges. But center of the target was purpose. And so what you're finding right now, when, when, when the um, heads of uh, companies and boards of directors pound on the table and ask me why, the kids won't, why young kids won't come to work for their companies, they keep saying, kids are asking them, well, what's your purpose? Like, what, what is the purpose of your organization? Well, you, have, you, you got purpose nailed in the public sector. And so that, I think, is your superpower. That's the place you start from. Is, is, it is about that process of helping them to onboard. And even if, if it's the first five to 10 years or later five to 10 years. And then it comes back around, right? Exactly. But you, you don't have to make that up. Right. That's the North Star for, to bring that talent in. It just has to be clearer about how they can actually help to move the needle. So uh, the public sector needs to be a better messenger, a better profit. And, and, and also really clear as to what the, I mean, uh, you know, one, one example I think that is, I think is, is very indicative is Code for America. You know, Jen Palka, the former, former um, CTO, uh, you know, the, the whole model of getting a bunch of innovators making a problem clear. This is what I talk a lot about the future of work is, is we have to become more problem centric. Mm -hmm. uh, agencies become very process centric. Mm -hmm. And then they forget what the problem was they were trying to solve. So the more problem-centric you can become, the more you can carve out the problem to be solved. It's clear. You can actually have an impact on it. Um, the Code for America just basically, through a team at the state of California, 
which suddenly made marijuana legal, uh, changing the records of 50,000 people who had convictions on their records and wiping them out automatically. And that was, that was only done because you brought a bunch of these innovators in to solve, solve that problem. problem. Okay. Any uh, questions? One to, uh, to my right. Hi, um, afternoon, my name is Jim Perkins and I'm gonna speak under my Army Reservist hat. Um, the question here about talent management, uh, in particular with talent management reform, uh, one of you mentioned that there's both a tech problem, there's data, and then there's recruiting talent. And I would like to push on what uh, Ms. Gordon had sort of mentioned about the off-ramp for what I'll refer to as the frozen middle. And um, affectionately, um, providing a, um, I'm so sorry, I uh, just, I teed it up and I sort of blanked out. Um, but the, the ability to retain uh, the right talent in there because many of the people that you have with these skills are leaving out of frustration. Even if right. you have the technology right. and the data, the lack of implementation is just killing them. Right. So I think, I think you and I both said and we just need to tackle those problems. So, so there's uh, just the demographic group of not people who want to participate, but people who are just waiting until their ten tenure is up. We, are, we need to help that. And, and that's, a, that's a difficult thing to say, but it's something that we're going to need to. The second is, if we don't create the environment where the talent we bring can thrive, that it, the promise won't have been enough. It's like, the, it, and it used to be that we were the only, the government was the only place where some of these really tough problems were being attacked. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to do mathematics, or if you wanted to work with high performance computing, you had to be in the government. If you wanted to do geospatial information, you had to be in the government. Now, there are so many other outlets, so we have to fix that. So when I talk about that whole stack of infrastructure and process, it is to get at that problem. Now, that is a big old honking problem for us, which is why I think the partnership in that membrane of saying, you know what, I want you to go out now and work on your craft and develop new things. And that is still part of our tent. I think the national security tent is much bigger than government institutions. That's one of the ways I think we can address the numeric problems of supply and demand and the talent problem of keeping people engaged in what I think the nation really needs without having them have to wait until we solve the bureaucratic issues of government structures as they exist today. Okay. So if you just took the small step of saying, I'm going to free that up and not worry about the sole source justification behind sending person A to company B, that is a way for us to jumpstart this. And I think the companies would love it too because it kind of inoculates their people in terms of the issues of scale and the issue of regulation and the issues of security that are important nationally as well. So that's what I would do yours. Thank you. I thought I saw another hand back here, did I? Way in the back. And if, if the other person, there was somebody, I thought somebody, if, if you can approach whoever has the mic on this side, approach them so we can uh, cut out a few seconds. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Anna Mitchell. Um, I work at Schmidt Futures as a product manager. I just graduated from Stanford's computer science department and I talked to a lot of people who are deciding about their first jobs out of college, a lot of people who are specializing in AI. And one of the things I just noticed over and over again is that it's so hard to turn down a super high paying job from the private sector with stock options, bonuses. Um, it's very hard to do that as a new graduate. So what are your most concrete proposals for solving this pay gap beyond only tours of duty but like recruiting people to government for the long term. We talked about that a bit in the report. Um, do you have a... a well, well a, a, a couple things. Uh, one of the things that has been proposed in various circles is the idea that, in fact, when people are taking on jobs that have mission and public service in mind and are based on these foundational technologies, such as people like yourselves who have graduated from these uh, places, why wouldn't the federal government write off their loans? Uh, you know, sure, the government may not pay them what Google will pay them, 
why not underwrite the cost of the education people have invested in these foundational technologies? So there are other ways other than um, a, a, that bonus check or, or that stock option right. that is meaningful and will I, have I a financial so. impact. Uh, any other? Um, so a couple of things. So the, the reason that um, you know, things like tours of duty are the, the things you initially default to. The, the idea that, that there's some period of time you're going to be focusing on a specific problem, but then go and make the bigger paycheck in industry is simply it's, it's um, risk reduction, right? So um, especially if you've got big student loans, then you're thinking about, you know, how are you going to pay all that off? But then what's the long term arc of your, of your career? So um, th there's a, several things. The first is to help, um, I'm just being a broken record on this, but uh, up the volume on purpose. Um, we, we just know from 50 years of, of work with Parachute that if you give people two jobs and one pays pretty well, but it's lacking the purpose that they feel, the reason they're on the planet, and another job that pays less, but it actually has that purpose baked in, if you can factor out some of the circumstantial issues, like the fact that you've got heavy student loans, people will choose door number two over and over again, depending upon their, you know, their risk profile. And so you just gotta amp up the purpose part, and then you've gotta carve out the problem so that it's very clear, and then there's probably a public-private partnership in between, mm -hmm. where actually they can be partially on loan to be able to solve problems over the longer term that is not binary. Um, these are all the you know, softening the walls of the organization kinds of mentalities. Yeah, we, have, we have retention bonuses and hiring bonuses and all those sorts of things. What we most could do is make it faster. If I could offer you, if I could give someone the offer at the same time they got it from the private sector, not deferred by 16 months. <laughs> no, that, that's real. No, I, I do. Oh, yeah. That's I, real. La last yes. question from the I audience. I couldn't decide how I'm long so it sorry been. about that. Hi, uh, John Radovan. I'm part of the uh, U.S. Air Force uh, MIT AI Accelerator in Cambridge. And uh, so I just came out of a tour in industry uh, with Amazon as part of the first cohort to kind of go through their machine learning university. And what was uh, huge to me was this idea of the democratization of AI. And a lot of these tech companies have developed these internal schoolhouses, if you will, to kind of upscale their force. So, you know, we talk about questions on the flow problem, the many types, and the pipeline problem. What do you see as the role for industry and for academia? And, and the FFRDCs, like Lincoln Laboratory, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, on helping to upscale the force to kind of create this organic uh, capability uh, within the DOD. Thank you. Quick answer. So just really quick. So, so, so first off, I just uh, I don't want to be word police. Um, I'm always worried about words like upskill and reskill because those sound like the industrial processes that we're trying to leave behind. It's, I'd rather, much rather it's actually a person that's trying to upgrade their own capabilities. But the, um, I, I think that there's, again, I go back to the sort of public-private interaction process, there's no reason that those organizations, those uh, private companies that have so many of these resources couldn't basically construct boot camps where uh, government agencies can be continually identifying the skill set that they want and they could have the processes by which they could dynamically connect to that program, have people do the immersive process and then uh, and get trained very, very rapidly. Uh, tours of duty such as the one you just did, I think we could do that at a much larger scale. People from the defense agencies and national security agencies spending time at companies. Number two, I think the, the government agencies do a poor job of you know, creating the sense of excitement for the kind of work that people can do in government. Anybody wanting to do machine learning on weather or on climate systems, the government has better data on that than anybody. So how do you attract people to come and work on the kinds of problems where the defense agencies and the government has better assets to offer to people who are AI people who are interested in those problems. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. I'll stand with their answers. Okay, <laughs> final, final word time is up. I know, I, I'm so sorry, I had, uh, I wanted, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> One word answer from each of you about what you're most excited about for an AI future. We've got negative 20 seconds. One word answer. Uh, it's going to uh, allow us to solve the hardest problems in the world. That is more than one word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd say uh, maximizing human potential. Okay. That's Curiosity good. enablement. Thank you very much. Please. <laughs> <laughs>
So we're going to take a 10 minute break and then uh, my fellow commissioner uh, Katrina McFarland will come up and uh, introduce our next speaker, Secretary Esper. Actually, if, uh, if 